Hello and welcome to another beautiful time on Executive Discuss coming to you on the network service of NTA. My name is Olola Diadini Jadili. This is a program that celebrates trailblazers, people who have made their mark and are still doing so in their chosen fields of endeavor. And today, my guest is a man who has been tested and he's trusted to deliver. I remember him clearly as a former governor of Lagos State um, during the military era. Um, and I remember very clearly the Operation Sweep. He was also at the helm of affairs in Borono State, which now encompasses Yobe State. And there he made his mark felt. Today, he is the head of that agency that controls the use and abuse of drugs in Nigeria. I'm talking of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency. And I want you to please join me as I welcome to the show the Chairman, Chief Executive Officer of NDLEA, General Buba Marwa OFR. Hello, sir. How are you? Good. It's good to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank yeah. you. Now, um, I know you, um, I've known you way back, but I'm sure that probably some people that are the younger generation today might not really know your antecedents. They might not know where you're coming from and your story. Can you quickly take us through your early years, your background? Well, um, I'm 68. Yes. Born in Katuna to a military uh, Father, we are basically military in background. Mm. My grandfather served in <clears throat> the army, so did my father. Uh, so did my late younger brother, who rose to be the general officer commanding three division, a division that both I and my father served in. Um, and my son is a lieutenant colonel, 
So we are basically a military family, family attended military schools, you know, the academy, very strict upbringing because um, my father used to be deputy imam of the battalion that uh, we served in throughout his career before he became an officer. So basically uh, this type of uh, upbringing, quite uh, regimented because growing up in the barracks in those days, the whole barracks is working up with a big room. Everyone, soldiers, families, um, protected, guided, and you know the military barracks is an institution that has everything that society needs. School, hospital, market, the, the, the whole uh, stuff. So, okay, yes, I know that you did all of that and then you joined the army, you served um, in various formations at the time you were out of the country and then you returned to Nigeria. Like I said earlier, I remember you in Lagos, Operation Sweep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I had stints in foreign service in the army as a military attaché in our embassy in Washington in the late 80s. Um, I also had another stint as defense advisor or defense attaché in a mission to the UN um, in New York. I was in the 90s. I served uh, as a military governor of Borno State, which was uh, together with the UOB at the time quite uh, challenging in its own way because the circumstances there are unique and different from Lagos. You know, Borno um, is an arid state and the difficulties especially of water. That was why I created the Ministry of Water Resources, Resources. first. There was no such ministry uh, at the time. Um, very hospitable, the, the people there, cooperative. And um, the revenue was, was tight, if you look at it, even though funding in those days, I would say, was uh, tight and the Naira was of greater value, but the state used to receive 50 million Naira in a month at the time to, to do everything. The two challenges, or three, if I want to uh, look, look at that in those days. First was the aridity, oh. the arid nature of the desertification. The desertification. And the ministry the, the, of, of forests. Forestry. Okay. Because we had to try uh, to, to plant, oh. uh, to, to, to break the encroachment of the desert. Of the desert. And then the security. In 1990, when I took over as governor in Borno, the, the president of Chad was called his son Habri. Oh. And uh, he was under onslaught of terrorists whose leader was called Idris Deby. Eventually, Idris Deby and his terrorists sacked his son Habri's mm -hmm. government yes, and the National that. Army of Chad. His son Habri escaped. The army that was now sacked entered Borno State. Since they couldn't remain, it remain was, it there. was uh, yes. So I would say a rough situation, almost what uh, uh, is happening Obtains uh, today. Th these days. So they actually encamped themselves in Borno State, oh. which was very wide. Not then Borno Yobi was 15% <coughs> of the land mass. land mass. I remember during the visit of the president, at the time, President Babangida, a flight from Nguru to Bi with a helicopter oh. was one and a half hours. So you can imagine flying within the same state. And there are places you live in the morning and get in the night, 12 hours in the, same, in the same state. So there's a big challenge uh, on security. How do you get to communities and save them? But through the grace of God, we were able to resolve these issues, working closely with our counterparts in the armed forces. And then, you know, long distances also have their challenges in transmitting power. 
electricity. Amenities. And so on. That's yes, Borno State. That's Borno. And then you moved on to Lagos. Yes, in the case of Lagos, um, the experience in Borno helped. Ah. Because I remember clearly the security. There was some, in, in fact, the security in Lagos <laughs> was easier to manage. Than that of Borno? Far easier. Oh. Far easier. Because Lagos is bunched up, small. Oh. And you could get you could quickly easily. to a position uh, that you could deal with issues, unlike oh. in Borno State. Yes. Um, the road network in Lagos, uh, where we did some 700 odd roads, uh, what most people didn't know was my team in Borno State, I actually invited them to measure and, and give me the first <laughs> proposal and, and then... In Lagos? Direct labor, yes, yes. Oh. Because I did direct labor. Yes, back then. In Bordeaux. And, and then we looked around for who could meet up with the challenge as closest as possible to what they brought to me from Bordeaux. Oh. That was how I got to engineer Ashukoya, who was, I think, a level 13 officer at the time. But he did very well with mm. his team. And uh, in three years, he rose to be a PAMSEC. Mm. I remember that you were the only governor, I think at that time, who did not go borrowing. Rather, you shored up the revenue of Lagos State. How were you able to achieve that? We, we, we did the IGR for the first time. We brought IGR from outside the state. Before now, it used to be the revenue board that used to do this type of thing. And they quadrupled the, the, reven the revenue. I think that was one of the foundation of the growth. Secondly, as you said, we didn't borrow one naira throughout my tenure. There were no debts from my government. Even the housing, and we did eight housing estates, those who deposited for the houses we made sure that we used their money to build the houses. And they had confidence and trust that we will not abandon the projects. So we did everything with their money, commissioned, and they moved in. All that we did was based on the revenue that we had. We didn't borrow. Quite interesting. Yes. Now, today, you are at the helm of affairs in NDLE. But before I come into NDLE, at the beginning, everyone, you're co you, you come from a militarized, I mean, a military background. Was it because grandfather, your father were in the army that you also decided, and then even your late brother decided to go into the army? More or less, it happens. Oh. When you um, are born and you grow up under a particular environment, that, that's all that your life has been. That's all that you see. You, you, you want to... <laughs> that's right. You know, the, uh, the marching bands, the drill, the uniforms, the exercises, the military exercises, yes. and stuff. Okay, January 2021, you took over the helm of affairs of NDLEA. In what state did you meet the NDLEA at that time? Failed states, I would say, using the words. Um, NDLA was actually half dead. But the chairman, House Committee on Narcotics, says no, it was not half dead, it was dead and buried. Um, it was in a bad state. That's one word that one can, one can say. People actually did not know there was such an institution. And a lot thought that NDLA was another name for NAVDAC. Mm. They, 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 they thought we all the same thing. That's, that's right. Um, yeah, that's in a word. It was in a bad state. But I was given a job to do. And I had to get on with it. We had to look at what would be the priorities? What do we need to fix? How do you go about it? 
uh, always uh, when you get uh, appointed into positions of public service, you have to begin with a needs assessment, isn't it? What What's uh, the objective of this organization and how do you uh, go about it? Fortunately, I was um, in the Presidential Advisory Committee for the Elimination of Drug Abuse before this appointment. So that gave me a good um, view on what the issues were and based on our recommendations, how do we tackle it? Because PASIDA was tasked with making recommendations on how to eliminate drug abuse in the country. And added to that, I had some limited experience right from Borno on drug use. We, we had some experience. It wasn't a major target in Bordeaux, but it was something um, that we looked at in those days, which eventually in Lagos were able to properly crystallize with the area boys area and girls boys. at the time, mm. who were a terror to everyone, everyone. especially ladies. <laughs> exactly. We had them trinkets and carried nice uh, mm -hmm. handbags yes. and people with fancy cars. They didn't go to certain areas because the area boys will accost them oh. and threaten to smash they the windscreen. Screens. You either, you, you, you the driver has to figure out which is safer, which is better, less expensive. Is it oh. the money, 2,000 or, or the, the whole wind, windscreen? Windscreen of the car. Yeah, and so on. Um, we were able to address that because for the most part, they were drug abusers. Oh. So we, we resolved that. The NDLA at the time was an efficient organization hmm. because we interacted okay. with Bamei. Yes. Um, he came along a couple of times and we gave uh, some help. We gave some vehicles, we supported, we, I believe, gave the NDLA at the time office facilities. Hmm. Uh, and in the drug supply reduction sphere, they are doing very well. So the state paid more attention to drug demand with the users, like users, the area boys yes. and so on. And we did the, the camp in Isheri, which is still in existence and looked after by Lagos State Government. Yes. Um, we also knew right from there, which persisted today. When you face the situation, drug demand reduction and you treat the abusers yes rehabilitate the abusers you have to also address as much as possible the causative factors, factors. Oh. unless you address the factors that led to the drug abuse so the need for drugs yeah they, they relapse mm. for instance if it's because no food, no jobs, mm. uh, frustration and misery. This led you to drug abuse, to, to attain a temporary escape. Then that fundamental problem- It's still there. If it's you still there, it. it ought to be addressed. So you can be treated, but if you go back to the same situation, situation you still face it. Mm. So mm. these are some of the things um, that we're looking at. All right. You have, since you took over um, from uh, January 2021, you said you met it almost in a comatose um, situation, the organization. What has the journey been like in this length of time combating the issues of drug peddling, drug use, drug abuse? Yes. The, the gratitude first has to go to the Almighty God for helping, giving us the perspective. And obviously nothing happens without the grace of God. And we have to give the glory to him. The president himself is the number one man as far as drug is concerned, because the willpower of the president is what is pulling and pushing pushing us, without which we wouldn't do much. Mm. Now, when he sets, when a president sets a panel or a committee like PASIDA to bring recommendations to him, it clearly means he himself is interested in it. 
He has seen that this thing is dragging the country down, destroying the country, and now, unless I fix it, it it's going to be worse down. for us. Yes. Others would leave it. You know, I say, well, you know, drug abuse. What the heck? This is not my priority. After all, it's their fault. Mm. The dregs of the earth. Mm. Let them continue to out. use what they are doing and so on, and face uh, other tangible things like building bridges and railways and, and other that. things. But not the president. Mm. So um, he said he gave us full support, encouragement uh, to get things done. Um, and, and then the crop of directors and workers that I have have been very uh, instrumental because it's a partnership here. Uh, one man obviously cannot make a forest. That, that's what it is said. So we have, we have that. And we also have the officers and men in the various commands. Long suffering officers and men who have over the years uh, not been having it easy. There's so much stagnation in their movements, in their ranks, promotion. Frustration, no encouragement, that their are old liabilities, their benefits are not given, and so on. This was the situation. But working together with them, and after the harmonization committee that I created, we were able to address some of these immediate thing problems. And they rose to the occasion. You can see. Um, the same people, mm. the same staff, the same directors that have been uh, achieving all the uh, successes mm. that we're having, which we expect to be more because the recruitment is now concluded okay. and we have uh, twice more people in than the four. Right. Our partners, too, have been very instrumental, that is, international partners. The country is you know, drugs everywhere, it's international. And unless there is this partnership, you cannot get to it. Mm. For instance, about three days ago, on the 8th, we seized in the port 40 tons of codeine, which is banned. 40 tons. That's a big quantity there. How did we get, get that information? We got it from our partners. Our partners from India, hmm. such and such is on its way. We've had this several times. The Captagon, we got it for six months. It was moving from one port to the other, hmm. changing ships and so on, but we kept our eye on the ball until it came. And our men are professional. They know what they're doing. What they're doing. Mm, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. Now, like it or not, Nigeria is facing a major war in terms of drug abuse, especially with the young generation who are supposed to be the leaders of tomorrow. I know that there have been several interceptions. Um, a, lot of the drug, a lot of drug barons have actually been arrested. I think um, in 2021 alone, you arrested over a thousand of them. But we're nowhere near where we ought to be. What are the policies and measures that are being put in place, especially to target the um, abuse of drugs amongst our youth? First, we have to face availability and access to drugs, oh. which is the drug supply reduction angle. If the drugs are not available or accessible, then obviously the people that are looking for it will not have it. Oh. We have to face that. And the main policy that we're there is to enforce the law. We seize whatever drugs are available in the country, on the streets, in the airports and ports, on the highways, in homes, workplaces, hotels, everywhere. We arrest those culprits and put them before the processes. So that's a deterrence and a punishment by itself. When you seize drugs, you are making it unavailable in the streets. Mm. And so if you look at it now, the codeine that was seized, yes. we bought 100 mils, it's like 7,000 naira. It used to be horse codeine, 400 naira. 
in the past. Even cheaper. So that's right. So because of the scarcity, uh, because we get, and, and we work with, by the way, I have to give uh, credit to, to the customs, SSS. We, we, we're all partners. Oh. We, we do, uh, they support us in this activity. And equally, we support them in return whenever we make arrests or seizures appertaining to them. So that is first the angle of taking drugs Away out of the system. And second, and equally important is the drug demand reduction where we have to face those who are consuming drugs. That, that's critical. And now that uh, the prevention of using drugs is the first policy uh, item. It's usually uh, the prevention that we face first, then counseling and treatment, and aftercare. After care, what happens after you have been treated? Those have to be lined up, as I mentioned. Otherwise, you go back to the same prevailing situation. And as far as prevention is concerned, which is the main thing. You remember uh, yesterday, uh, because I think it was carried uh, by various news uh, organizations, we were in the University of Abuja to launch the War Against Drug Abuse Club. We have to reduce prevalence. We have to reduce our youths. So in the university campuses, we said, do a drug integrity test for the new students and for the returning students, oh. including security agencies. Oh. No one gets into the NDLA without a drug test. Then we have to look at the families. Because we start with the families. Yes. Parenthood. Parents themselves have to set the example. A parent who abuses drugs already, what is he teaching the children? Hmm. They will just... To tell the same path. Just, very important. Then the communities. It's important that all communities must have their own drug abuse clubs. Hmm. Uh, war against drug abuse clubs. Wada from communities. In the past, communities used to be each other's, used to have each other's... Uh, each other's brothers keep mm. in the past. And we want us to bring this back. So everybody's child is your child in the community. Within the community, you know who are those Peter medicine stores that are dealing drugs, or who are those Meshai or Mesuyas who do drugs under within the community. Mm. Take action. Like they are doing the service Kulumi Mili. Oh, yes, Kulumi Town unions, they ran up to the occasion. We in the NDLA do not uh, support uh, flogging and other violence. Rights. Mm. But what's important is communities have to stand up and deal with mm. The school systems, tertiary, secondary, even primary now, we work with the Ministry of Education, and I know that the curriculum has been adjusted mm. to drug education. Oh, okay. They to do more, and schools have to rise up to the challenge. And the various inspectorate divisions have to inspect and make sure that these things uh, are properly implemented within the, the, the curriculum. curriculum. Then the clergy. Nigerians listen to their religious uh, leaders, you know, like the pastors, bishops, imams, malams. Um, so the advocacy by religious leaders is a very important input in drug demand reduction, as well as traditional rulers. That's why we have suggested that the drug, uh, the war against drug abuse committees at the community level should be headed by the Mbales okay. or the Mayanguas the at the small uh, level. Oh. Uh, and of course, structurally, this goes all the way. Every local government should have this type of committee for drug abuse, state, and of course, at the national level, I chair the interministerial committee. You've done so much, you're still doing quite a lot in combating the use and abuse of drugs. But I'm sure you'll also agree with me that to a large extent, 
especially amongst our youths. It looks like it's now fashionable, especially amongst our, um, the artistically minded ones and even quite a lot of our youths to use drugs. When you're, you're taking these things, these substances away from the streets by breaking that chain of supply, but they also resort to other things that give them the high. So is it not a case of breaking up at one side and then encouraging the other? Yes, uh, advocacy will have to cure that because, <clears throat> and good hygiene, obviously, governments and NGOs, um, they do all kinds of things, you know, gutters. Yes, and so even and so um, forth. septic tanks, that's, burial that, grounds. That's right. So, yes, um, but the largest... Uh, most advocacy, that's really what is important. For people who have ears, listen and understand that this thing is not good for you. It destroys your health, destroys the organs, uh, turns you to a psychotic, hearing noises, sounds, terrible situation. But happily, the new psychoactive substances, which is the category that you mentioned, it's really, really at this point infinitesima. But it's up to all the agencies and bodies that are just enumerated uh, to continue uh, the drive at every opportunity to drive the point home. Do not do drugs of whatever form. It's bad for you, for the society, for your health. And do something more wholesome with your life. And also, uh, I must say that the government, in its fight against poverty, is addressing this matter. Because most of them are pushed because of need, normal need, you know, need uh, like jobs, like regular meals, like health, good health care, water, and so on. The absence of these things makes a life empty, dry, frustrating, and they look for escape. Mm. That's really where we are. And the government now has this uh, poverty elevation where 100 million Nigerians, that's the intention of government, will be pulled out of poverty over the next uh, several years. So there's continuity in governance. Even though in 2023 there'll be a change in button, mm -hmm. it is as expected that and those who will come in will continue in this. Hmm. Very important. For some, yes, for a lot of people, advocacy will work. But we also know that there are some that advocacy will not work for. And I'm coming as basic as places like motor parks, area boys on the streets who are not ready to listen to anything. Rather, perhaps the only language they will understand is force. Now, I'm asking myself this. How are you going to handle, or how are you handling that particular area? Not for us. Oh. We appeal. Yes, there are a few cases. Even in, to in, a bus driver in, that in, in, will in, only smoke uh, or maybe sniff a drug before he gets on the stairs? No, not for us. That, that's, that's the law now. Oh. It's against the law to use uh, drugs. It's now left uh, to us, the NDLEA, to determine okay. this user, should he be treated according to the law? That's what the law prescribes. Mm. Or does what he need, uh, or, does, or, or is it counseling that he, needs. that he needs? We make that determination, which is a determination that we will never expose. Because if we do, probably some will think using is not criminal. Mm. And so they will go all, all over, continue to use. And that's the impression you give when you want to legalize cannabis. Mm. Because when you legalize cannabis in a country like Nigeria, where we smoke away or drink or snort 10.6 million Nigerians, and you say it's legal, you'll end up with 50 million Nigerians. Doing, doing, cannabis. doing cannabis. The use of drugs <clears throat> is illegal in our act and has 
punishment that we determine, since we don't want to criminalize the use of drugs, we determine whether what is actually needed is a counseling or treatment. So back to the issue that you raised, like the motor parks, the area boys, and so on and so forth. In Lagos, initially, I treated, that's my government, mm. treated them as criminals, which is what they were. I must say. Exactly. Because when you attack innocent people, people steal their watches, that's a criminal behavior. And they were treated as such. Uh, but eventually, um, we decided to look the other side oh. of rehabilitation and bringing them up to be useful members of society and of their communities and to be proud of themselves for their families to be proud of them. of them. So we rehabilitated them, gave them skills, and that's still not enough to give skills and leave people to go because they will need money to buy the sewing machines or the, the chickens need, yes. or the bakeries to do stuff. So that's really the approach of what you said. For those who are not willing we persuade them to go for counseling and treatment. Oh. And usually families are eager to do this. But when the addiction has reached a stage where they are a threat, either to themselves or to their families oh, or the to the society. communities, we, the NDLEA, compel them to go for treatment. Even today, I had to give authorization for such somewhere. Our officers will seize the person uh -huh. and take him for treatment. Oh. Because he's a threat to both himself and his family. Moving around the home with a knife, trying to attack uh, people, you can't allow that yes. to happen. That is also part of the law enforcement apart from what we do when we seize drugs from people. So that takes us to the issue of counseling centers Aha. and rehab centers. rehab centers. We have in the country, for government, 33. Fair. 33. So that's a very low number. Not even for Nigeria. one per state. No. If you look at no, it. No, no, there are states that don't have. We've gone to all the states that say they don't have. But the administration of President Muhammad Bahri now, there's a compellence for the federal government under the Ministry of Health to build one additional rehab center per state. Mm. And from the recommendations of PASIDA, each state government by itself should do three. Mm. One per central zone, zone as a minimum. Um, but communities are encouraged, and I've had the honor to commission community built rehab, rehab centers. centers. Because when you have a drug addiction situation, uh, and most people who have it know that they have it and they need help oh. because they can't help themselves. They have to hit the bottle or the pill or the injection. They know they need help. And there's nowhere to go for help because there are no rehab centers they sink deeper, exactly, which is what we want to avoid. And the NDLA itself, we have rehab uh, centers in our commands. In the year 2021, we rehabilitated and counseled and discharged over 7,000 of those that we arrested and others that are brought to their families. It's a continuing struggle. Mm -hmm. And this year uh, in the budget, we believe there are three more rehab centers from the NDLA For budget the NDLA. that will come up. So it's a continuous thing, very important. Mm. We're also looking at uh, a call service, oh. calling service. Okay. That we believe between now and June, we believe it will be inaugurated because of stigma. Yes. There are people, they don't want to go to a rehab center. They want to see. But they know they need help. That's right. But that decently dressed woman, mm. 
Does he want to be seen? Yes, going into a rehab yes, center. Yes, a rehab center. So we're, we're having the call center, which would be a bank of psychologists, psychiatrists, wow. nurses, psychiatric nurses, counselors, 24-7. That would be good. That will take calls, offer help, uh, guidance, counseling, and where to go, which is the nearest rehab uh, center facility where we are calling because it's countrywide. Yes. We will base it here. It's some of the steps. We are also moving to uh, the drug integrity tests. Oh. We are recommending drug integrity tests. In place of work, anybody are hiring, do a drug test so they know that to get a job, they have to be negative. So that will cut it down. Schools, if you know that you go to school, university, you do this test, and if you are negative, you won't start with your mates, or you won't do the exams, that's another discouragement. Workplaces, the motor parks that you mentioned, random tests, we're encouraging that. Security agencies, we are also, we are already working with the army and other services. We do their test for them. We ourselves, charity must begin at home. We all test ourselves here in the NDLDA. So uh, we don't joke with it. The integrity test, we now wish to extend to marriage. It's very important because if we want to face demand reduction, we have to find ways of discouraging our youths. And the youths, all youths, after school, after a job, marriage is the next. And nobody wants to get married to a drug addict. So why do you want to take a chance when technology has made it easy? Easy for you, you can, to You can know. know. The same way you don't want a HIV. HIV, yes. You bring uh, the, the you thing. Know, the only difference here is if my son or my daughter is going to marry the other uh, guy. Let me be the one to do the drug integrity test. Yes, for the other party. That's right. Okay. We, we, we will select the clinic mm. <laughs> to do it. <laughs> we won't allow because all kinds of games. Yes. You know, we've learned a lot in the NDLA recruitment process. Mm. We do this and they tie urine. They, they will tie somebody else's urine in a little pouch. Yes. We discovered that when they are using okay. it. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. So now... So they give another person sample. That's right. So now we escort them. To go give the Absolutely. Urine. The ladies will escort the ladies. <laughs> the men will escort <laughs> the men. And so when they come for the interview and they see they are doing drug tests, some of them run away. Run away. They, they don't even... But bother that coming because forward. they know that we are going to pick it out. Oh. So the drug integrity test, even in workplaces, yes, in some places I know in the U.S. Armed Forces, it's computerized. So in a base, the names are all the computer will bring out maybe ten names, and just say, okay, such and such and such go randomly on social day. And you know if you have found positive there would be sanctions Definitely. for it. It would affect your record. Um, these are the type of things we want to bring. That you're introducing. Now, you've done so much in terms of um, seizures, but it looks like you're barely scratching the surface. Because as you have agreed earlier too, these things have to do with some international connections. And I know that in Asia, and uh, maybe part of the Middle East, there is a high prevalence of um, drug transfer between Nigeria and some of these countries. How well, at least you mentioned India with the codeine um, case, but even going beyond things like codeine, how well have you been able, has um, the NDLEA been able to reduce this inflow, even into Nigeria? Partnerships. Partnerships, um, the, the, the India that you mentioned, we have a trip coming up with, with our opposite numbers there. Partnerships, MOUs, so that you cooperate 
exchange intelligence, exchange information, and if it means extraditing uh, criminals, we've caught a couple uh, recently. The Interpol sends and we, we get them and send them off uh, where they belong uh, to jail. So partnerships, uh, that is the most important way that we've been dealing, even continentally. Yesterday, we had uh, Gambians. I gave them certificates from the Gambian Drug Law Enforcement Agency. Uh, we have the partnership with them. They trained in our academy, and we just uh, discharged them yesterday to go back home, carrying with them the skills that we have learned in Nigeria. So it's a, it's, it, it continues. Um, sometime, I think six months ago or so, we, we had a major seizure, what they call captobon. These are amphetamine type pills, which were for the insurgents and bandits. These are pills that when consumed, they give you a superhuman, you know, endurance, fearlessness, more ferocity and so on. Um, through the grace of the almighty God working with our partners, they told us which containers, we tracked the container until they arrived and were using, we used our canine unit, the dogs. They discovered this thing was inside machines. Machines were built deliberately uh, just to conceal um, the, the, the captagons, the like half a million pills. And we're just imagining if this had gotten to the Boko Haram and all those yes. the bandits, you can imagine the, the, the disaster that oh. would have created. Now, you mentioned scratching the surface. the surface. I think now we've done a little bit uh, more than that. Okay. But when you see over 3 million uh, kilograms, oh. that's a substantial amount. amount of the streets. Yes. And if, if we wanted to, to, to distribute that to all Nigerians, it would go around at least 10 or 15 grams to every uh, Nigerian. So that's something that is, that is out cool. of the way, which will go for destruction oh. since uh, we, uh, they're not used. So it's a continuous, the NDLA um, is up and standing oh. and facing the challenge fully. And we trust and have confidence that Nigeria, being a drug-free nation, is not a mirage. Mm. It is achievable if we continue. There, there are countries, and when you say drug-free, it's like when you say a country has full employment. Yes. That, that does not necessarily mean every, every single, single person. Every single person is employed, Aha, yes. but there's a certain but minimum majority, acceptable yes, something taking. like that. So now, you, you, you're talking of um, collaborations and all, but amongst your officers too, in the past, I don't know about now, but I'm sure that it, it's not something that can be done overnight. In the past, NDLA officers have also been accused of complicity. Are, are there any mechanisms in place where you're able to identify the bad eggs and weed out the wheat from the shaft? Absolutely. We have a special unit which reports to me directly. directly and which I assign directly. That unit monitors and evaluates all the commands, the seizures, the exhibits, the exhibit rooms, the prosecution cases, so if a case is going too slow, we have to find out why, why, what's going on here? And they check the records and obviously the exhibits to oh. see is there any tampering, uh, the motorized patrols and stuff. Are there uh, seizures which we are unaware of oh. in case some deals are struck and so on? And we come down heavily. Um, I also created a provost marshal's office that enforces discipline. So once we get these reports from these teams, we send it off to the Provost Marshal mm. and they are disciplined. We have disciplinary committees, we have all the room procedures. Um, we, we don't joke with it. Mm. Discipline 
in an organization such as ours is, is job one. Mm. You're a man who has always, you've had, you have your hands in several things. I mean, you've achieved a lot in several areas. And I keep asking myself, this man who is always so busy, how much time does he have on the home front when you're not battling drugs and drug abuse in Nigeria? All my time after work is at home mm. because I've now grown too old to, to do clubs, <laughs> <laughs> clubbing and all that. Mm. Those, those were things we did as, as yes. youngsters. So one spends most of one's time at home. at home these days with family and there's a lot to do as you know, especially in this day and age of uh, uh, science and technology. Mm. So what are those things you do in your private, in your leisure hour, even when you're at home? Family time, uh -huh. music. Um, I have my own chess computer, uh -huh. which I play this. I uh, started playing chess in school, secondary school. And it's something of great interest. Uh -huh. Movies, reading. Aha, uh -huh. you enjoy reading. Now, finally, General Buba Marwa, you're... It's not been patronizing here, but you're a man who has a good fashion sense. What determines your fashion sense? My wife. <laughs> she buys all my shoes, clothes, mm. and stuff. Mm. And colors? She does. Bed whites uh, seems to be my favorite. And ash. White and ash. Your final message to Nigerians on how we can read this nation of drug, drug prevalence, drug abuse. Interestingly, the NTA this year is working with the NDLEA and um, we're going to be advocating against the use of drugs and drug abuse. So what's your own message to Nigerians? The first is to thank NTA. I think last year um, it was rape and uh, on a visit to the Director General he did give uh, us a promise that they're going to face drugs and it is happening. Oh. We are very encouraged and we appreciate and we hope this will contribute immensely and we'll take the opportunity to call all the media organizations. It's a strong message to them to also to this, this line. We've also um, uh, engaged the artists, the artists, Singers, actors, we had the, 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 the guilds uh, a few days ago. We appealed to them, first of all, to set the tone by doing good example. Because what they do that are youths emulate. emulate and copy. And we've appealed to them, set the good example, and continue the advocacy for positive advocacy for people not to use. And from there, my general message, please, Nigerians, say no to drugs. Don't take drugs. Drugs are bad for your health. Why do you take something that is injurious? Your organs, your brain, your livelihoods, complete washout. Stay away from drugs. Stay away from drugs. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, even though I wish I had more time, but I know you have other national engagements that you need to attend to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank I you. Enjoy this. The yeah. fight against drug and drug abuse, drug prevalence, drug reliance is one that needs to be fought by you and I. We cannot afford to have a society that is dependent on the use of drugs. So we must wipe dr drugs clean from our streets and from our society. That's the message I am taking away from this conversation today as I have been speaking with the Chief Executive Officer, the Chairman of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, General Buba Marwa Oefar. Why don't you join us again, same time, same station next week on another beautiful episode of Executive Discuss as we draw the curtain on this week's show. My name remains Ololadi Adin Jadeli. Stay away from drugs and God bless Nigeria. Bye-bye. <music>